Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris and Jesse. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris, and with me as always is Jesse. Hello. And... Uh, before we get in too far with the show, I'd just like to remind everybody to click like or subscribe. If you like what you hear, you can ch check us out on YouTube or iTunes. You can tweet us at SST Show and uh, send us show ideas. We'd love to hear from you. You can also email us sixstringsandthings at gmail.com. Jestercat.com, excuse me. Sixstringsandthings at jestercat.com. Let's make sure we get the emails. You know, it's probably just safer to tweet us at SST Show. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, Jesse, uh, how have you been? What are you up to this week? Been good. Been good. Yeah. Uh, playing a little bit of guitar. You know, spring has sprung here in Central Pennsylvania. Uh, so, it has. Yeah. <laughs> Been a lot of outside time, so uh, I need to take the guitar outside. That would let me practice more. Um, well, we but this. as it was, I practiced some more um, jazz voicings. This on the four, three, two, one string set. So like the thinnest four strings which is kind of cool the voicings are like a little thinner sounding you know because there's really no lower strings but it works really well with like not that i've been practicing with a band but i mean if you have a bass player it's kind of nice to get out of his way you know and use those smaller voices so um cool yeah cool. so and what have you been doing actually something very similar Really? Uh, yeah, a couple of different things I've been working on. You know, still working on that Blues for Dummies book, and I found mm -hmm. two things that I really like. The uh, there's a lead example, and there's a rhythm example that I've been just sort of messing around with, uh -huh. learning from the book. You know, and I got that down. Now I'm just sort of playing around with it, adding things, taking things away. So that's been a lot of fun. I'm getting ready to move into these sections of. Um, basically uh by genre so i'm skipping the delta blues stuff so i'm sorry if we have a fan of delta or piedmont uh uh ragtime or country blues just not my thing i, I listen to all the tracks from the book listen mm -hmm. to get a sense of, for my ear but this is just something i don't want to pursue i'm going to get into the early electric you know the bb king and kind of stuff so uh yeah i'm going to pick up the book there and, and keep going but um anyway I've been working on some stuff similar to what you've been doing in a way, starting actually today. My lesson was all about um, the f uh, top four string voicings for seventh chords. Oh, sweet. That's pretty much what I've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got um, <laughs> got some four. universal synergy going on here. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of cool. I think it's like one of the first times it's been this much overlap based <laughs> on what we've been working on. Um, but yeah, so my instructor gave me um, four different voicings for uh, each for a major seven, dominant seven, uh, minor seven, and minor seven flat five. Okay. So there'll be 16 different chords, if you will, that right. he has, has given to me. And, uh, you know, we were playing along with them today. And right now what I'm doing is... I'm going to learn four of them. The way he has them, it's kind of kind of interesting. There's, he has it in a grid, and if you go across the grid, it starts with major seven. All mm -hmm. right, you go across to the right on the grid, and um, what you work with is basically changing one note at a time. So you go from major seven to dominant seven by flatting the seven. Okay, and then you go to minor seven by f now flatting the third on the dominant seven. Right, and then you go to minor seven flat five by flatting the fifth. Sure. Of the, the minor seven. So, um, and so he's got this really cool, or next time you're over, I'll show it to you. It's really mm -hmm. cool sort of systematic way of going about. And what's nice about it is as you go from the major seven to the dominant seven, because the fingerings are so similar, you really see yourself flatting that seven. You recognize what string is the seventh. Mm -hmm. And then you, you know, you can actually see it being flattened. You right. see the third being flattened, so on and so forth. So um, I'm working on one row right now where the root is on the B string. Okay. And I've uh, been sort of going to try to commit those to memory. I'm almost there, actually. But then I want to play some, like, 12-bar blues or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
with that so that I can have a feel of where it is up and down the neck and, you know, help cement in what, what are the notes on the B string? Cause I'm pretty lazy about learning the notes. on the B string. Sure. So you use um, like the B string note as like your anchor for the chord. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the root. And then, you know, um, you just change each note one at a time to go from one chord to the next. And right. you're right. They're thinner sounding. Um, but in some ways they're nicer sounding too, because, you know, if you, screw ups are more obvious. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> because you don't have these bass notes drowning out the details. Yeah. So I find that, you know, if I mute a string by mistake, it's much more noticeable on these than your typical E A or A shape um, seventh bar chords. Right. You know, because, I mean, there are times when I was first learning how to do the E shape seventh uh, bar chord where I was muting the seventh inadvertently. I just couldn't get over it and it still sounded OK. That's not going to happen with the four string. Voice right. Thing. Well, and the other thing is that, that kind of the ones that you end up messing up are, are the inner voices, because that's like where a finger sort of gets, I don't know, <laughs> in the way. Yeah. And if your root is like right there in one of the middle voices, it's more likely that you're going to kind of kill that note. Whereas your your bottom note, usually you're going to get really clear. So like in a power chord, you know, your bottom note is going to be your root, you know, and the next one's going to be the fifth. The next one, it, you're always going to hit root fifth. So it's going to sound OK, even if you don't have the flavor of the chord. Right. But in this one, yeah, you could take the root out altogether, which if the bass player is playing it, that's fine. But if you're playing alone, so you'll end up in that shape, probably the seventh is in the, in the lowest string yeah. on, the, on the four string. So, um, uh, yeah, that's what you'll hear. Actually, the, the fingering that I'm doing, the third is on the lowest string. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The finger that I'm working on right now, I believe that's the case. Okay. This is like, I've only been doing this for six and a half hours and I haven't been playing for those six and a half hours. So, right. you know, yeah. So I'm, I, but I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, the set that I'm learning right now, okay. um, the G string has the third and it's okay. the lowest string on the, uh, that's being played. Um, nope. I can't be right. The D string would be the lowest string that I would be playing. If it's a four string voice. Right. Yes. 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 And so the third is on the D string. Okay. Yeah. So that, and then something else that we touched on today, and I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, maybe our listeners have heard, have heard of this too, um, making some more interesting um, sort of um, chord substitutions by playing ninths where you should be playing sevenths. So for example, I've, for a long time, you know, when I'm playing a 12 bar blues on the four chord, I'll sometimes play a ninth. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. No big deal. But this is a little different. This is playing a nine chord where the root is the third of the chord you intended to play. Okay. So if you play a, let's say you're supposed to play a dominant C, C7 dominant. Okay. Okay. Then E is your third. Mm -hmm. So you would could play an E9 chord. It would be an E, yeah, it'd be an E9 chord. Right. All right. If you were playing a minor, um, C seven, then you could play a, I believe it's a minor nine. Okay. I believe I, you know what I had this down. down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm, uh, it actually I'm be probably, like, like an E flat, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So if e you say, if you're yes. playing an E, well, if you're playing a C seven, now I got mixed up with what you said. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, so in the in the scale, so if you, I mean, you can keep stacking them up. So if you played uh, like a ninth chord, leave the root off. That is some kind of seventh chord, you know, right. based on the third. So yeah. So yeah, so here I, I wrote it down. I, I take notes when I'm when I'm in my lesson, and so basically for a dominant seven, I wrote go to the third of the chord and play a minor seven flat five. Okay. Which is the same as a ninth chord. Right. Right. For a minor seven, go to the third of the chord and play a major seven. seven. Mm -hmm. For a major seven, go to the third of the chord and play a minor seven. Right. Right. And so this is sort of what, what my instructor referred to as upper structured voice chord voicing. Yeah. So you're basically just leaving off the, the root of the original chord. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. You're leaving the root off the original chord, and the result is for a dominant seven, the result would be a nine chord. For the minor seven, the result would be a minor nine. And for the major seven, the result would be a major nine. Right. And I'm sure we've probably lost all of our listeners. Like, <laughs> Sorry, um, people. This is like some <laughs> hardcore music theory nerdiness going on here. So this is where music becomes kind of math-like in a in a yeah. good puzzle sort of way. I know a lot of people like aren't big into math, but it's not really that hard of math. It's just you know I I don't know how to put it. It's kind of a puzzle, and and it's kind of fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of blues players like, you know, your Stevie Ray Vaughan or whatever did this. And I don't know if they knew the theory, how deeply he knew the theory, but right. it just sounded good. Right. Sure. Yeah. Things, you know, this sounds good to me, so I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So my so basically I, I so we did that today as in my lesson and then we did these voicings. And by the end of the lesson, like my brain was full. <laughs> you know, I'm drinking like, oh from a gosh. fire hose. <laughs> yeah, I was like drinking from a fire hose, and I'm like, okay, wait, I gotta write this down. You know, they try to get this all sorted out, and so, but basically, what my my instructor had said at that point was, well, here's the thing, you know, practice these 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 uh, four string voicings, and then as you can, come back to that nine chord stuff, but keep them separate for now, and you know, focus on the the voicings. So I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to incorporate some of that um, that nine chord stuff in a little bit more. But most of the seven stuff that I play almost, you know, when I'm messing around jamming at home by myself, they're dominant sevens. Yeah. Well, you come from the kind of the blues angle. So, I mean, there would yeah. be a lot. Yeah. I mean, every once in a while I mess around the two, five, one. And of course your major and minor sevens come into play there. But, you know, most of the time I'm playing some kind of dominant, which is why I'm so excited about these um, four string voicings, these top mm-hmm. four string voicings, because it's going to give me something new to play. And the next time we jam, I'm hoping that I will be in a position where I'll be able to mess around with them a little bit. Sweet. Yeah. Probably That's sound cool. like crap, but at least it'll be, a, it'll be different than the E and A shape all the time. That's good though. <laughs> it's, it's all like learning. I mean, yeah, I, I regularly get humbled <laughs> with my own inability. So, <laughs> so, uh, any birthdays this week? I do have two, in fact. So uh, speaking of jazzy stuff, um, March 6th was Wes Montgomery's birthday. March 6th, 1923. So for those of you – well, if you're into jazz, you know Wes Montgomery. <laughs> and if not, he was um, a jazz pioneer uh, in the uh, 40s and 50s. And um, yeah, awesome. Um, kind of the forerunner of uh, – the later crop of like chord melody, Joe Pass, you know, my favorite guy. And um, yeah, good. The other one, totally opposite, Steve Harris, bass player for Iron Maiden. Aha! <laughs> one of my favorite high school you know, bands that I was in high school. Oh, I'm aging myself here, dating myself. Uh, March 12th, 1966. So, oh, a year older than me. It's terrible. You're not necessarily not dating yourself at this point. I mean, you could have liked retro music in high school, right? That's true. <laughs> you know, you could have been like, oh, you know, I'm into that classic rock, you know, or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I just love those guys. If if you haven't listened to Iron Maiden, I think they're still like one of the preeminent as far as like guitar interplay with like two guitars and bass. Because yeah. the Harris was one of the cooler bass players in that he didn't just kind of thump, thump, thump. Like he was doing uh, – you know, pretty good riffs and going along and doing like octaves and stuff with guitar and some interplay. And he had that galloping kind of, I mean, that was a big Iron Maiden thing. Like half their songs were like that. And he could really get it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like all their hits, I think pretty much are like that. And his fingers really started, were really moving. And uh, not that it matters to the musicality of it, but the way the guy could play while running across the stage, full tilt is something. Yeah, my experience with Maiden is largely one song at a time kind of stuff. Yeah. So you might, you know, you hear like a song and on the radio, and then I don't hear Maiden for like, you know, weeks, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's been pretty much my exposure to Iron Maiden. So I've never made the connection to the da, 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 this kind of thing. Oh, yeah. But now let's just say it. Like, I think the different Iron Maiden songs, yeah, exactly yep. what's going on. The galloping so, bass. I was, yeah. I mean, I, the three albums that they had, like uh, The Number of the Beast and uh, Peace of Mind and Power Slave, I mean, that whole era, I mean, I would listen to a lot of Iron Maiden. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. I don't want to over – see, if I talk too much about Steve Harris, then it kind of belittles Wes Montgomery. I don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. We want to respect boundaries here for our birthdays. Uh, 
uh, for our guitar players. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I thought I'd mention part of the show. I We've been talking about uh, PRS guitars on and off. Yes, we have. Um, you know, uh, mostly because of my sort of recent infatuation with them. And uh, I did get a chance to play the, the new CE24. I was at a store called Coffee Music in Westminster, Maryland, and they are a PRS dealer. And I got to play uh, a lot of different American models, actually. I played the CE24. That was the standout because it's the one I've been wanting to try. It's the one with the bolt-on neck. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was a great playing guitar. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I would like to play it again um, to get a kind of a feel for it. I think it's it's one of those, as we talked about over texting this past weekend, it's one of those guitars that you and I could both have in our collection. You know? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. it's got it's got that thin neck. I think they call it the pattern thin, which as soon as I picked it up and started playing, I was like, Jesse would like this neck. Yeah, that's my style. There's some like the one that I really like is the CE, the 22 fret version of the semi hollow body, which yep. has a couple slight variants like uh, they had been making it with a pick guard and a weird sort of comma shaped um, F hole. The new one has a more it doesn't have the pick guard and it has a more traditional like F hole shape to it. Um, both beautiful guitars, you know, and like some of the literature out there, they kind of differ in the neck uh, profile. Like I've, I've seen it with like wide fat and I've seen it with wide thin with the C's. I don't know if they call it pattern thin. I know the naming convention is, uh, I'm not familiar with it, but, um, uh, but I'm pretty sure that everybody says, yeah, whatever it says, it's a, a wide thin neck, you know, it's right. a comfortable neck. So that's cool because that was one thing I didn't really care for with the whole S twos because I do like the thin necks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thin and, and I don't really have very many. I don't have any thin neck, really thin neck guitars. Yeah, uh, and this pattern thin would definitely be, I think, probably the thinnest neck I would have on a guitar. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the uh, looking at the guitar itself, the finish um, was was impeccable i mean it was just a really nice it was an american sort of core kind of you know type finish on it really nice pickup sounded good i had to play it through a line six amplifier which no offense to line six i was not impressed with at all is this um, the amplify line or which line was this do you know i don't know it was a used one it was the only one in the store that was plugged in in mm-hmm. the section that i was standing they had a whole bunch of used fenders laying around but none of them were plugged in you know me i was gonna go for those first so I was gonna oh sure yeah um uh, but the i i was not at all impressed with the models uh and i i this this used amp was 350 used yeah 350 is what they were asking for used and my hundred dollar Mustang One has better models in it. That's amazing to me. Um, I'm trying to think of what because that would have been one of their higher line amps. I mean, that's not like one of the low end Spider amps. Right. Um, and I've they're not my favorite modeler. I mean, I, I have a Pod HD like the like the latest greatest like desktop version they have, which I don't <laughs> think they even make anymore because they've moved on to other things. But. Um, I thought they were okay, but actually I prefer some of the other stuff. I like the Digitech modeling even in cheaper models than that. Mm-hmm. And I know it must be a personal thing because I know plenty of people really like the pods better than any yeah. other, you know? So oh, okay. yeah. you know? It's absolutely personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so I was just like, you know what? I wish my Mustang one was here. Um, yeah. <laughs> eight inch speaker at all would have been fine, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, because but you know, and I should have like a dummy, I didn't unplug the guitar and play it, you know, on, on amplified, should have done that. But, um, but yeah, you know, it, it just it played well. I after I got them playing out, I played a three thousand dollar American core and I played a five thousand dollar American core. Wow, and uh, yeah, my mom was with me and uh, she, she said, Well, how much does that guitar cost? I don't, I don't know, the price I five thousand dollars like, oh my god I'm like yeah i think this might be the most expensive guitar i've ever played so that's not a guitar a, that's a car yeah, yeah exactly you know and so and it was it was a fine guitar I, I really enjoyed playing it but i i personally was um in many ways i liked the ce better mm-hmm. um i think part of that was because it's way more affordable it's two-fifths of the price of the five thousand yeah. dollar guitar uh, so definitely, I, you know, I'm keeping an eye out on, um, reverb. I think it's reverb. Mm-hmm. Um, the used, the, the nicer used guitar site. Um, and, uh, keep an eye on some older CEs, but I don't know if the older CEs have the same neck. Yeah. That's something to check on just to be sure. Yeah. 
And I would check some forums and see what people say about them because, again, I'm not 100% sure that the documentation is, is 100% on. Right. But I, I, I'm pretty sure the same manufacturer makes the CDs now that has for years. I think it's that world music. I don't think that's changed. Not that there aren't necessarily differences from year to year, but um, so I think overall the quality is is a high, good Korean made, you know, import. What? Well, that's the SE. The CE is an American made. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Silly yeah. me. So what? Uh, what? What kind of uh, price range are we talking then for the new Two. ones? Two for the new ones. The new one. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the used ones I've seen online from uh, about from about a decade ago or so, they're coming in at eleven hundred or whatever. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're, the presses are all over the place, um, but all the comments and forums say they like the old, the old ones are, re- are great. People like them. People are hanging on to them. Um, I, you know, whatever. I, I'm definitely keeping an eye on them. No, no time soon am I going to buy one of these things. But I've been looking for that sort of centerpiece to my collection. It depends on the deal. <laughs> yeah, and this could be it. You yeah, know, this could be the, the centerpiece of the collection, the one the one sort of nice standout guitar, because it's that nice sort of cross between the, the Fender and, and, and Gibson in terms of scale length. Yeah, it's different than what I already had with the 24 frets. It's got a different neck. It has the locking tuners, which I could I could put locking tuners on any of my guitars. Sure. But, you know, it, it has a nice trim system, which my my strats do not really have a great trim system. Even yeah. my American, it's a lower end sort of trend system with my American. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, it could be the one. In fact, you know, listeners, if you have other suggestions for a centerpiece <laughs> guitar, you can tweet the show at SST Show. Hashtag Chris should buy this. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's cool. I, I am impressed with their trend just because uh, it's like a traditional – six screw kind of mechanism and yet it by all reports it's one of the most <clears throat> staying in tune excuse me trim you know that's not a locking trim i guess yeah. it's kind of partially locking because of the tuners but um yeah and that's impressive because it's not a, a two point you know two screw type of thing but hey whatever works I mean, obviously they figured out how to make that thing stay in tune well yeah, and I should have another chance to 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 play one in the not too distant future because I'm going on the factory tour. Oh, lovely! June. Yes, so so my lovely wife um, decided, uh, decided that we were going to have short trips for for the summer for vacation, and the first one she picked out was the Eastern Shore of Maryland, largely, <laughs> I believe, dictated by the presence of the factory. So. Uh, Kudos to her for picking out the. Uh, you have a lovely wife. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty good. She's pretty good. Yeah, and it's like okay, cool. And actually, she sent she emailed me the itinerary. She's like, I want to spend this day here and this day here, and then the last day of the trip, P- she had PRS factory tour. I'm like, oh, you're awesome. That is cool. <laughs> so, yeah, is that something you have to get like tickets or reservations or stuff for? You have to make reservations. So I called earlier in the week, and um, they're already booked for a couple of days. Wow. They don't start until – they don't do the tours until I think June or May or June. Mm-hmm. And so when I called, uh, I said, hey, I want to make a t- uh, reservation. And they said, we're not scheduling until June. I'm like, well, that's perfect because I want to go for June. And I, they, and I said, what day? And I told him, I said, well, let me check the computer because we've already got a couple of days booked for school tours. So fortunately, it looks like we got in. We're good to go. And uh, yeah. That so, is cool. So that mini vacation will be topped off by uh, an excellent guitar factory tour. Looking Indeed. To it. Cool. Well, you enjoy yeah. that. Yeah, it's, it'll be fun. You're not going to make it through the summer without buying a PRS. <laughs> <laughs> the chances are not looking good right now. Let me tell no you. way. <laughs> oh, if, it, gosh. if it does happen, it'll be a miracle, a small miracle. Um, so, um, yeah. Now, let's talk about what else. What else do we have to talk about today? <laughs> I didn't come prepared for this class. I didn't either, yeah. <laughs> so I think maybe we will just go ahead and uh, wrap it up here. You know, we chatted about four-string voicings. We talked about this PRSCE guitar. 
And uh, folks, if you want to hear more, tweet us with show suggestions and say, I would like to hear Chris and Jesse talk about blah. And we will. Right. And we will. Because we can talk. We definitely. We're always looking for suggestions for the show. Uh, so, again, if you like what you heard today, please click like, click subscribe on iTunes and YouTube. Uh, follow us on Twitter at SST Show. Don't forget, hashtag Chris should buy this. If you have suggestions on something I should buy. And uh, I'm not saying I will buy it. I'm just saying I'm looking for suggestions. Um, and until next time, everybody, just keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things of Guitar Adventure is a Jester Cat production. For more on the show, please visit www.jestercat.com. You can follow us on Twitter at SST Show, and you can email the show at sixstringsandthings at gmail.com. Thanks to Jesse for playing the intro music. Mm-hmm.